okay, so I just thought we were going to zoom in on uh, one particular country measure against sectional text index masking, and we are going to limit ourselves to hardware masking. Um, so this is a brief outline of what I'm going to discuss, and I'm just going to dive right in with the introduction to hardware masking. I'm going to skip this slide because I think you said everything that's on this. Um, so the most important thing is we split the secrets into multiple shares. We implemented your box in a way, your functions in a way that the sum of the output shares is the function of the sum of the input shares. You make sure, of course, that none of the intermediates in here are ever unshared, so you always have to stay with these um, this split uh, variables. Um, if you use Boolean masking, it's easy for linear operations and difficult for nonlinear operations. So now, if we are in a situation of hardware, the situation becomes a bit more complex than in the case of software. Um, I'm not saying that masking in software is easy, because there's definitely uh, uh, some challenges uh, there, but in the case of hardware, um, there are glitches in the system. And um, earlier, Josep talked about cloak glitches as a fault attack, but these glitches also happen if you don't mean them to happen. So this is because different signals arrive at different times. In this example, B is zero and then A becomes zero, so the product AB should stay zero. But because the signal B arrives just before A, there is this uh, temporary fault in the signal AB. So this is a transition that um, should not happen and we also don't want it to happen. Because like um, Benedict said, transitions consume power. And if, uh, like for the first five years when, when um, people were working on masking, it was believed that the power consumption only depends on the intermediate results of your calculation. But when glitches happen, this is no longer true. So this makes things more difficult. So let's look at an example. This is a mask end gate that was introduced in 2003. So pretty early days for sectional countermeasures. And um, so we split up the input variables in two shares. So that means that if you want to do a multiplication, there are four cross products. And um, the way this mask end gate works is it assigns one output share just to a random value, and then the other output share is the sum of the random value with the <coughs> multiplication x, y. And how do you arrive there? If you start with the random value, and then one by one add these cross products, then you can be sure that every intermediate result here is independent of x and independent of y. But with a glitch, um, imagine, so this is secure if the circuit is ideal, but imagine that R is late uh, because it has a longer path to travel in your circuit. So what would happen is that you are computing the unshared uh, product x, y. So that's a problem. Um, so to refer to Frank Beeson's talk, what is our system model? We are looking at a circuit and it consists of combinational logic and sequential logic. And we're assuming that the sequential logic stops the glitches from propagating. So these wires are all stabilized values. And then what is our adversary model? We assume that the adversary has, uh, can put D probes on the circuit. Um, so suppose that he probes this wire, then to account for glitches, we're going to assume that he can see also these wires. And suppose that he can put a second probe on the system, then if he probes this wire, then he can see also these pairs. Um, we call this a glitch extended probe. And so by assuming that the adversary has access to this information, we include the worst possible glitch that could happen in this combinational logic in the model. So the advantage of this model is that um, it's very easy. It doesn't depend on the, the device that you're going to use because glitches are very difficult to um, predict. It doesn't even depend on the, act, on the specific combination of logic that is implemented there. So this is a very nice high-level view of the system. Now, one more thing. If the adversary probes this wire, one thing that he cannot see is uh, these wires. Because we assume that independent wires have independent power consumption. And this is called the independent leakage model. So this is our version model for most of this talk. And then if um, the first provably secure masking scheme in the presence of glitches was threshold implementations, and they are based on three principles. 
correctness, non-completeness, and uniformity. So first correctness, that's an easy one. It just means that if you sum the, the output shares of, of your max implementation, it should be equal to your function applied to the sum of the input shares. Suppose that you want to um, implement a multiplication um, of x and y, and you have three shares for x and for y. That means that there are nine cross products that I list here. So to achieve correctness, all you have to do is make sure that all these cross products occur in one of the output shares. Yeah, so that's easy. An important principle is that of non-completeness. So it says that each of your output shares should be independent of at least one input share. So now I've distributed those cross products over the output shares in a way that um, like Z0 is independent of X0 and Y0, etc. So this way, you assure that the power consumption of this block is independent of at least one input share. And in that case, it doesn't matter whether there are glitches happening in this block or not. It only depends on two shares, so it cannot reveal any information from the other share. This is also, by the way, why we are now working with three shares instead of two shares from the first example. Then, uh, one thing to remember is that if you are going to use the output of these blocks as the input of the other blocks, and non-completeness is satisfied in both, then you have to separate these stages by register because um, the register needs to stop the glitches from propagating between the two stages. These registers are a pretty important thing to remember because they make it very difficult to make low latency um, hardware mask implementations. Because every every time you have a new linear nonlinear layer, you need to separate the registers. So that's an important detail to remember. Then the final principle is uniformity. Uniformity uh, means that um, all the possible ways to share variable x are equiprobable, so they occur with the same probability. And since threshold implementations assume that this is the case at the input of every block, um, it's important that your mask blocks also um, preserve this property. So in most cases, um, in, in the case of this multiplier that we were using, this was not the case. But uh, we often solve this by adding some fresh randomness. So then I can explain to you why threshold implementation ha have these provable security guarantees. On the one hand, we have non-completeness, which assures that each component function is independent of at least one input share. On the other hand, we have uniformity, and that means that if you don't have one input share, you don't have any information about the secret. Together, this means that the power consumption of each component block is independent of the secret, which then means that the average power consumption of your circuit is independent of the secret. And this is true whether you have glitches or not. So, you heard um, earlier with Josep that the minimum number of shares is D plus one. And so for first order security, we were just using three shares instead of two shares. So it was only in 2015 that it was um, that the first that was realized that you could do hardware masking with the minimum minimal number of shares. So two shares. Um, and this is an, an, a masked end gate. So we have four cross products again. We remask some of them and we synchronize them using a register and we compress them back into two shares. So more generally, if you would have an end gate with T inputs then your state would extend to d plus 1 to the power t shares. An important thing to remark here is that this gate is only secure if the input sharings of x and y are independent. <coughs> I'm going to come back on this later. And then um, finally, if you have this mask end gate, then actually you can mask any circuit because any circuit can be written as a combination of end gates and XOR gates. So you could replace any end gate with this gate and you're done. <coughs> Except it wouldn't be very efficient um, because the one end gate just turned into four end gates. So you can imagine the scale. So uh, for a bit more information on masking more general Boolean functions, if you're interested, I'm going to refer you just to these two sources. Um, if we look at the cost for increasing security order, then you get very scary graphs. So the size of your circuit increases exponentially with the protection order against tight channel clamps. Also, randomness is a very important cost factor, and you see that it 
increases a lot with the protection order as well. And keep in mind that this is only the randomness you need for end gates. So for an entire circuit, you almost always need an online PRNG to provide this randomness. Um, and then I'm not even talking about where the true randomness comes from, but that's a different story. And then um, the situation is not as bleak as these figures may look because these are huge numbers and also if you try to do an attack at these orders, uh, the attack complexity also increases exponentially. So. <coughs> then you might be more interested in what an AES implementation costs. So we have here an unprotected AES implementation, which of course uses zero randomness, and it goes between two and three thousand gates because this is a serial implementation that has only one S-box. And the S-box is used for all the 16 um, bytes of the state. So what happens if you add first order protection? There are a lot of works on this, and, but you see that the area at least doubles. And then uh, various works have explored various trade-offs between area and randomness. Very recently, there's an interesting work that implements AES with zero randomness, but as you can see, there's a, it can actually be optimized quite a lot for area. And then if, we, if we're gonna go one protection order higher, so to second order, then the first implementation by my colleague Thomas um, was again more than double, but then Thomas optimized it, the area quite a lot, so the area reduced to here, but at the cost of more randomness. And then later works have also optimized the randomness. So a lot of work has been put into AES implementations um, up to second order security. Um, now I want to also point to the fact that for the first order implementations, there's quite a big <coughs> difference between these guys and this guy because if you have non-zero randomness, you always need a PRG because this is only the randomness for SBOX and there are like 200 SBOX evaluations in one encryption. Whereas this guy uses zero online randomness, so he doesn't need a PRG. Uh, of course, it still needs the initial randomness to obtain the initial masking. Those are references. Now, if you find yourself trying to make a mask implementation yourself, then there are a number of pitfalls that you want to avoid. For example, the very first higher order, implement, higher order threshold implementation was a second order secure threshold implementation of the Kafkam cipher. Or rather, it was su supposed to be second order secure, but after a year, uh, it was realized that it wasn't because of multivariate leakage. So that means that if you combine the power, com power consumption of two different clock cycles, then you have leakage of the secret. So at this point, it was realized that uh, deep order completeness and uniformity don't give you security against deep order side channel analysis. This is only true for first order. So the situation for higher order security is a lot more complex than for first order security. Another thing is, now I'm gonna come back on these input independencies. So we have here a multiplier, and if your input X and Y are perfectly independent, then non-completeness is satisfied. We complete those four cross products and everything's fine. Suppose you want to implement a function like X to the power of 3, which you can achieve by multiplying X with X squared. And X squared is a linear function, which means it's pretty easy to mask and it doesn't require any randomness. But we have to be careful with linear functions because they introduce dependencies. And this is potentially dangerous for non-completeness. If you look at the cross products here, we can see that they get both shares of x, which means non-completeness is broken. Now, this example may seem a bit obvious, but if you're implementing an entire cipher, things are a bit less easy to detect. And it also happens in real life. Let's say um, there was a Ketchak, there was a uh, publication of a Ketchak protected implementation where the S-box was perfectly fine, but in the entire cipher there was a non-completeness failure because of the linear layer data that was introducing dependencies. So this was detected and then solved by placing an extra register. Um, that's, that was enough in that case, but in general, and in this small case, you need also to add some extra randomness to really make sure that these two inputs are completely independent. Okay, so that's something to watch out for. And then finally, 
we quite like serial implementations in mass implementations because it allows you to use one hardware block for different inputs. So for example, the S-Box is the most complicated part of our circuit and we usually implement only one S-Box for all the AES state bytes. Now, you have to be careful for how those inputs are related, these various inputs that you're going to put into it. So we have here as an example a mini state of three elements, and we're going to multiply two of them. This multiplication you can assume is uh, fine, it's, it satisfies some completeness, but then if the state rotates, then we compute instead of x times y, we compute z times x, and then we compute these cross products. There is still nothing wrong with those cross products, but if you look at the transition from this cycle to that cycle, then we see that um, in these two cross products, in transition, we have both x0 and x1. So that means that in the transition from one clock cycle to the next, uh, non-completeness actually fails. So this happened to us when we were working on a bit serial protected AES, and it took us quite a while to realize why our implementation was leaking, and in the end we realized that it was a pro problem similar to this one. So, then, if you're making a mass implementation, it's quite difficult to not make any mistakes, right? So this is why verification is a very important part of mass implementations. So what do we verify? Um, well, non-completeness would be a good place to start, because it's a very important requirement, and if you don't satisfy non-completeness, chances are high that your implementation is going to leak. So there's already a very efficient tool available for this. But keep in mind that non-completeness alone is not sufficient. That's not going to um, guarantee that your implementation won't leak. So what is sufficient? So let's look again at the adversary model. What information does our attacker have? So that was those glitch extended probes. So we actually need to require that the mutual information between the glitch extended probes and your secret is zero. If you don't know what mutual information is, you can Think of it as a independence, statistical independence. So that's a nice condition that we can check if we want to have, um, if we want to be sure that our implementation is not going to leak. But keep in mind that there are a lot of ways to probe a circuit. So the number of possible probes, if you attack something at D order, is the combination of D out of the total number of wires in your circuit. So this is a huge number, and it grows again very fast with the order, it's a verification order D. So um, how should you verify your implementations? There are a bunch of tools available in, um, in literature. There are some formal verification tools which are very exhaustive and they only work for small blocks. Then there are some simulation tools we do, which do leakage detection in simulation. And um, that means that they're a bit more efficient, so they work on larger blocks. There's also the, the non-completeness verification tool. Then if you're working on, for an ASIC implementation, there is a, there's a tool that does a leakage detection on a post place and route simulation. So this post place and route simulation also simulates the glitches. And then finally, if um, you deploy your implementation on an actual device, you can use the power traces um, and do a leakage detection test and these leakage detection tests we usually do by a, like a hypothesis test. So um, there are advantages and disadvantages to all of these methods. So uh, like I said, these formal tools are very exhausting but only work for small blocks. And um, the more you go up, the more efficient your method becomes, uh, but the less exhaustive. Then a very important thing to keep in mind is that if you do things in simulation, then your leakage detection and your formal verification is only as accurate as the model that you're using. And we know that there is always a gap between theory and practice. The models never approximate the reality completely. So that's why it's very important to always test your things in a realistic environment. On the other hand, if you only test your implementation on a real device, then your results are very much dependent on that device, also on the temperature, when you're using it, on your measurement setup, on the place and routing that was used, etc., etc. So the nice thing about simulations, etc., 
is that your results are platform independent and you have a bit more guarantee that they are going to carry over from one platform to the next. And then finally, this is related, but on a real device, you, it's difficult to really validate that your masking scheme works because measurements are always noisy and noise can hide leakage problems. So for that reason, simulations and uh, testing things on computers are also good because that's always noise free. So then what should be your takeaway from this? Basically that you should use all these tools um, as you are progressing in your design process. You should um, use some formal rules, formal verification for the smallest blocks. As your circuit grows, keep doing things in simulation because if there's a problem, you want to detect it early on. And then if you're going to tape out an ASIC, you definitely want to try some post space and write simulation because it would be an expensive joke if it turns out to leak. And then um, always, always, always test your implementation on a real device, so like an FPGA, even if you're going to do an ASIC, but keep in mind, FPGA and ASIC have different leakage behaviors. Um, but so the more verification mechanisms you use, the better. Uh, and not a single one of these is enough. So that are the references for the slides. Finally, I want to say a bit more about, um, so I've been talking the whole time about glitches. Um, so this is a talk about hardware masking. So glitches might not be the only problem, but it's the problem that has been talked about most in the last few years. Um, a lot of research has been going into it and um, it's probably the most important. But we have to keep in mind that, I already said it, but there is a gap between theory and practice. And we've often noticed that if we followed all the steps correctly and we went to the lab, that our implementation would still leak. And it's because, yeah, again, the models are not always correct. So uh, more recently, newer research is investigating other hardware effects. Um, apart from glitches, for example, uh, the possibility of coupling, um, which is that if you, there are capacitances between wires, which uh, mean that the independent leakage assumption that I was talking about earlier um, could not be valid. So it could be because of these capacitances, capacitances or because of the fact that all the wires share the same power source. Um, so this is being investigated, like what is now the influence of these things on the leakage. <coughs> So to sum up, I, I catched up, we can go have coffee. Um, so uh, we saw a lot of AS implementations and most of them focus a lot on area and randomness. But if you talk to someone in industry today, I, they're probably going to tell you that area is relatively cheap and low latency is much more important. And remember that I said that because of all these registers that you need between nonlinear stages, that low latency implementations are very tricky. So this is a very interesting direction for future research. Also, um, mostly first order implementations have been optimized and we can now do them without using any randomness. Um, but higher order implementations are still very challenging, especially to press the randomness. So that's another thing to look at if you are in this field. Um, this is the same thing as Joseph said. Uh, this is only, so masking is only one kind of countermeasure and real, in reality, you probably want to combine it with other countermeasures like hiding. If you are a cipher designer, I would tell you please keep, in, keep these things in mind when you are designing a new cipher. It's very important that as of now, um, you design ciphers that are easy to mask. So uh, this has to do with the multiplicative depth. Um, come talk to me if you want more pointers about it. But it's really important that um, side channel attacks are considered from the start. And uh, finally, verification, verification, verification. I say it three times not only because it's very important, but because you have to do it more than one time um, and with more than one method. Thank you. <laughs>